In the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told a series of parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of the shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this, he asked? And they answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Let me tell you a story I once read. There once was a gentleman farmer, a former resident of the city, who thought that life would be easier and more tranquil in the country. If you're old enough, think of Eddie Albert in The Green Acres Show. Although he called himself a farmer, he didn't know a lot about growing crops. Because he had not grown up in the land, like most of the other farmers out there, he studied all of the Farm Bureau manuals and talked to the locals about what he should plant and when he should plant it. He carefully drew out a plan for his field. Plotted, plowed the ground, pulled up the weeds, and in neat rows he planted seeds that he had selected from the local seed and feed store. The work was hard, harder than he had expected it to be, but he threw himself into it with great enthusiasm and dutifully sowed the seed in straight rows. Because he knew very little about farming, he was dependent on the seed packaging to tell him what he was planting. He couldn't tell a pumpkin seed from a soybean, but the picture on the package and the instructions told him what he was planting, where he should plant it, how deep. And midway through his planting, he came across a seed in one of the packages that he did not look like any of the others. It was smaller, more roundly shaped than the other seeds in the package. At first, he thought about just putting it in his pocket and then maybe throwing it away when he got back home. But curiosity got the better of him, and he decided to plant it in a row with other seeds in the package to see what it would grow. To the farmer's great satisfaction, seeds began to sprout all over the field. Some grew tall while others spread out along the ground. In some cases, leaves began to sprout, and pretty soon there were small tomatoes and beans and tiny ears of corn growing in nice, neat rows. It was a source of great joy for the farmer to sit on his front porch and look out at the fields and see the literal fruits of his labor that were starting to grow. He had almost forgotten about that one stray seed he had planted until one day he was walking between two rows of corn that had grown up to his waist at this point. And in the middle of one of the rows, Another plant was growing that didn't look like any of the others. It was spindly and brown and showed no signs of bearing fruit, but he decided to leave it alone to see what would happen. That year, the plant grew more like a bush than a stalk. It put out lots of little limbs and no apparent configuration. It was shapeless and frankly ugly and took the water and shade of the corn stalks immediately around it but it had put down roots to the point that it would have to have been more trouble to pull it up than to leave it alone. So the farmer decided not to bother with it. 
That year, the farmer had an abundant harvest of all sorts of vegetables. After he had gathered all of the crops, he plowed under all the dead bushes and stalks. However, that mystery plant seemed to thrive, so he just plowed around it. The plant survived the winter, and the next spring it began to grow taller, even before he began to plant the other crops. He didn't even bother to plant anything close to it, because he already knew that the plant would just crowd out anything else so that it wouldn't grow. He also noticed something else that seemed a bit strange. Every once in a while, one of his neighbor farmers would be driving by and would start to slow down. Sometimes the farmer would even stop and get out of the truck. Then he would stare at the bush that was now as tall as a man's head. Sometimes the farmer could see one of his neighbors laugh. But most of the time, they'd just shake their heads, and get back in their trucks, and drive on. After this had gone on for a while, the farmer decided to ask his closest neighbor just what the deal was. He found him down at the feed and seed with some of the other farmers. When he asked him about their behavior, his neighbor said, Oh, we were just wondering why in the world you would plant a mustard bush in the middle of a corn patch. All of the other farmers began to laugh, but the gentleman farmer was stunned. But I didn't know it was a mustard plant, he protested. I didn't have any idea what it was. Well, that's what it is, his neighbor said. And I'll tell you something else. It's going to be a lot of trouble. In a couple of years, it's going to take up a big chunk of the middle of your field. It's going to keep other things from growing close by even. That's not just the half of it, one of the other farmers chimed in. Birds love mustard bushes. Pretty soon, you're going to have a whole flock of crows and starlings and jaybirds building nests in that tree, and they're going to be eating all of your corn. You better do something about that tree before it's too late. So the farmer went home, wondering what would be the best way to get rid of the mustard tree. Now we can leave the story right there without much of an ending even. We've already taken up a lot of time just to retell a story that Jesus told in just 54 words in the English translation. It was only 45 words even in the Greek. But if I hadn't elaborated on the story a little bit, it's possible that we might have missed the point. If we don't think about the parable too much, we might have thought it went something like this. The kingdom of heaven is a place where marvelous things happen. It's like taking the smallest seed that you can find and planting it, and God takes that little bit of effort and makes it something big and beautiful and makes something useful out of it. Or it's like a little bit of yeast that the woman adds to the dough, and before you know it, rises into a great big sustaining loaf of bread. Isn't it wonderful the way God works? We've all heard sermons and teachings to that effect, and uh, something to that perhaps. That may not, however, be the point of the parable. If you're talking to, and taking a stab at interpretation, you'll probably get that the seed is the Word of God, the spiritual truth that God loves everyone and wants us to be part of this great family of faith. This is the third week in a row when we've had stories about planting seeds. Two weeks ago, we had the parable about the sower sowing seed in all sorts of soil. And last week, we discussed in some ways the story of the good seed and the seed that produced weeds growing together. In each of these cases, Jesus is talking to his disciples about what happens when we spread the good news in our community. The kingdom of God comes in this world. We may even have the opportunity to join with God in spreading God's kingdom. But sometimes, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, it takes root and sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the figurative soil of the person's life. Sometimes they receive it and sometimes they don't. And sometimes, as we tried to point out last week, what is growing is good seed and sometimes it isn't. But you just have to leave it until it is grown to find out which. Because while it's growing, it's frankly impossible to tell until we can see its fruits in maturity. In the first of today's parables, Jesus is again using seed as a symbol for what you and I have to share with others. 
What we may fail to see in this story, however, is the seemingly foolish way again in which it is planted. There were wild mustard bushes growing all over the Middle East during the time in which Jesus walked the earth. But they were seldom cultivated. Even if you did plant them intentionally, you wouldn't put them in the middle of a field where other things were growing. You would plant them away from everything else that you were trying to grow. Or as our farmer inadvertently demonstrated, you will choke out everything close by, and the birds that nest in the bush will eat the rest. In other words, mustard bushes are a nuisance to some things. You have to realize that neither mustard seed nor yeast, as it is spoken of in the second parable, were viewed positively in Jesus' world. Mustard was a weed dreaded by farmers the way today's gardeners dread kudzu or crab grass or bindweed. It starts out small, but before long it's taken over your field. And similarly, yeast was a contaminant and almost always represents the pernicious nature of sin when mentioned in the Bible. Why then compare the kingdom of God to a weed or a pollutant? Because both mustard seed and yeast have a way of spreading beyond anything you'd imagine infiltrating an entire system and taking over a host. Might God's kingdom be like that? Far more potent than we'd imagined and ready to spread to every corner of our lives and, in fact, every corner of the world? In another place, a few chapters over, Jesus is going to use the mustard seed to illustrate how a lot can come from a little faith. But in our text today... He's simply telling us that if you sow God's word in the middle of your carefully organized and scrupulously attended world, you are looking for trouble. Just as the farmer took satisfaction in seeing everything grow according to his expectations, most of us are happiest when things go according to plan. We follow the rules and we think we know how everything will work out. But if the kingdom of God is truly like a mustard seed, then be prepared for the unexpected in your life. Yes, just like a mustard seed, and just like the yeast the woman sows into the flower, even a small presence of God's kingdom has big effects. The woman literally hides the leaven in the flower. Though we cannot always see it, it is mysteriously and inevitably performing work for growth like yeast leavening bread. When God's kingdom is present, we cannot help but be changed. Society cannot help but be changed to reflect God's will. Communities in Greenville or anywhere in the world cannot help but be changed when it's at work. But there's more. Like a merchant that sold all that he had to buy the pearl, the discovery of God's presence among us disrupts our normal day life and priorities. It requires risk and sacrifice. It's like finding a treasure and pearl that possesses those who find it and shapes their lives. When I read that parable, like many, I'm sure, I can't help but think of the antithesis to Gollum's obsession with the ring of power in the Lord of the Rings stories. He was so obsessed that everything about him changed. But if we recognize the treasure found in discovering our place in God's kingdom, we too might be overcome by its incredible power for shaping our lives for good. We might just recognize that following God is worth everything we have. Whether we go to a place that is foreign to us, or if we're simply living our lives wherever we are, we answer the commission we are given by God by acting like mustard seeds and yeast, or those who hide pearls and treasures in the field and others to discover them. We have incredible opportunity to partner with Christ in spreading the word of God in ways that change people's lives and change communities for the better. And it will grab each person differently. Perhaps that's why Christ told so many different parables. But that's, that is why we have studied them for the past now three weeks. Maybe there's been something in one of those parables that caught our attention and has given us a new understanding about the very nature of God's kingdom. Commentator David Lowe says that for some people, these different parables will function as something of an evangelical warning. Be careful. People who have been infected by the gospel have done crazy countercultural things like sharing all they have with others, standing up for their values in school and in their workplace, looking out for the underprivileged and sharing their faith with the people around them. Perhaps two others, however, 
These parables will serve as a much-needed word of encouragement. Hang in there. God's new reality is closer than you think, already seeping into your life, even though you can't always see it or feel it. To others still, these parables will come as a profound promise. No matter what it may look like, God's kingdom will prevail. And so in the face of war, we claim God's peace. When confronted with illness, we look to God's eternal healing. When faced with hate, we proclaim love. Why? Because the kingdom of God is coming, and before you know it, it will transform everything. As we live lives of faith among the people of this community or any community, whether we are openly sharing the gospel with our words, fulfilling Christ's mission with our actions, like restoring home and granting people shelter, looking at people with dignity and bridging the gap among communities and cultures, we are spreading the word of God. And it will catch each person with whom we share it in a different way. But each time we do share it, it it's like that mustard bush in the farmer's cornfield. It grows and grows, making more room for others and forcing everything around it to change. So may God bless you as you walk with Christ, as he sows the seed of the Spirit on the path, among the rocks, among the thorns, and on the good soil serving as mustard seeds and yeast whose small actions in a short time can have life-altering impact and reveal the treasure of God's kingdom to others.